We'll begin this morning with the latest on the release of the 279 students kidnapped in Zemfara State. And after spending days in the hands of their captors, the student of the Government Girls Secondary School in Yangde, Ganjebe, has regained freedom. Video footage showed that the girls in the early hours of this morning at the Government House in Guso. Uh, the girls were abducted from their boarding school in Yangebe, Zemfara State, last Friday morning. It is the latest mass kidnapping from the school in recent weeks. Arranged gangs often see school children for ransom. President Muhammad Buhari condemned the latest kidnapping as inhumane and totally unacceptable, end of quote. A rise news correspondent, Awal Ibrahim, has more on this. These are the 279 students of government secondary school, Jengibi, in Zamfara State that have just been released. They are at the government house in Zamfara, just about to be addressed by His Excellency, the Governor, Bello Matawali. All right, the Zamfara State Governor, Bello Matawali, expressed great pleasure at having the girls back. Hey, in this moment, I'm full of joy and happiness for seeing the self returns of these my children. <laughs> it was on Friday, which to me is a Black Friday, when these young children were now from Jan Gabriel Girls Secondary School. Since when the incidents happened, myself, my family, the whole security of my cabinet, we did not sleep with our ulamas and our leaders who have been free for several times of these our children. Alhamdulillah, today, Lord Almighty, Showing his powers. And uh, Awal joins us now on the phone for a quick update. Awal, uh, if you're there and you can hear me, I can say good job you've been doing thus far. I saw you break the story earlier this morning. We understand that there's been a briefing. Uh, what's the latest, Awal? Yeah, good morning. The governor has just finished briefing the students and they have been taken to a medical facility where they should be examined, according to the governor, until they are satisfied medically fit for them to be reunited with their respected family members. Well, um, Awal Ibrahim, good morning. Uh, well, I mean, I uh, would like you to give us a few details about the, the girls. Um, what time specifically were they released? Because all we know is that uh, the release happened uh, early this morning. And uh, what time did they get to uh, so And what is next? What are the arrangements uh, for them to be reunited with uh, their families? Yes, the news of the, you know, the true negotiation as well as the release came out thing last night. We were waiting at the government house in Guso. Around 9 p.m., we saw buses driving out, so we become a little bit optimistic that perhaps uh, negotiation is ongoing positively and maybe they might secure the release of these girls. So at the early hours, uh, that's around uh, 5 a.m., we saw the buses coming in with these students. So the governor came out, he received them outside, and he now went in bank to the chamber where they went and met him there. He sympathized with them. He encouraged them that this shouldn't deter them from pursuing their educational career. He also called on the parents and advised them that they should not relent, that their girl child should be seen, that they are properly educated. And the governor lament that in the process of this negotiation, there were some individuals whom he did not mention that they tried to, you know, advise the bandits not to release these students, that they will now give them whatever amount of money they want. 
So the, the governor was sounding a little bit political. We don't know if he is referring to the opposition party in the state, but actually he said uh, no mischief will, you know, deter him from delivering what he wants for the people of Zamfar State. Well, there's no way of knowing if he was referring to the opposition in the state or anybody else, because the governor seems to be seems to have had the habit of being cryptic about his claims. He doesn't name names as he ought to. I want to ask you if there's been a reaction from the president or the presidency, and why is there a discrepancy, well, apparent discrepancy? Because you've reported that 279 girls have been released, and the media reports throughout this ordeal was 317 girls were kidnapped. Yes, actually, the, 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 yesterday I had a conversation with someone here. In, so what he was saying, though I, I just don't want to rely on that, but he was telling me that what the bandits were saying, they are going to release others on free of charge basis where they will now remain with others until they are being paid ransom. But in an interview I had with the State Commissioner for Security, he told me that no student is remaining in the hands of those bandits. So the figure was 312379, and now this morning we are told they are all 279. I think later maybe the school record will be the determining factor this time around because they are all GS1, 2, and 3, and SS1 and 2. The school is yet to graduate SS3 students. So SS2 are the senior. If they are resuming back, we are expecting each and every student to resume. I think the school record should be the only thing that will ascertain the true number, the total number of population of that school in terms of okay. students. Okay. Okay, well, good one about the school record, but ca can we press this further? Can we investigate to be able to get a level of accuracy? Because you've gotten to, you know, uh, different positions. As if somebody is saying there are still some that are there as bargaining chief. Can we put this to the governor, maybe when next you see him, that how many students really have been brought out? And is there anything about some deal somewhere being done with the remaining ones? A oh, while, well, quickly, briefly, briefly, a oh, while. Yeah, no, the, the, the governor was particular. 279. The state commissioner for security said 279. But this figure is below what was given officially because they said 379, later 312, 317. So the figures are not adding up. But now, if these children are reunited with their families, Perhaps parents who are yet to see their own children, if at all, not all of them are being released. That is when the issue can now come up. All right. Thank, thank you so much, Awal. I mean, we've seen this case over and over again. Let's not forget Leah Sharibu, too. Uh, that's all on our news headlines. Take a short break now. When we return, we'll have Rotus Sadiri, Michael Wilson, Adiswa Moro, Aaron Akiri, to give us updates on Africa, global business, COVID 19, button activities across the globe. Stay with us. All right, welcome back to the show. Uh, still the morning show right here on the Rise News Channel. Our dependable Ruth Suduri joins us now for Africa Business Update. Ruth Suduri, good morning. Over to you. How are you? Good morning, Rufai. Good morning, Doctor. Good morning, Tundu. Good morning, morning. to all our viewers. Yes, um, it's one of my favorite things to do, actually. Company earnings. This is where we get to look at the business environment within which companies in Nigeria have been, you know, uh, engaging in their practices in and to see how the environment has affected them. So we have three earnings reviews here. Try to get to them as quickly as possible. Starting with Dangote Sugar Refinery, they just released their results uh, over the last um, 24 hours. And you can see they're all in green, pretty impressive. Revenues, top line revenues, 214 billion naira. About 96% uh, uh, of their revenues are due to their sale of 50 kg bags of, uh, of sugar. Lagos State, as far as segmented regions are concerned, Lagos amounted to about, I think about 48% of their sales. So revenue up by 33%, their gross profit was up by 40%, their 
operating profits that was also up by about 48 percent profit before tax 52 percent increase profit after tax at the bottom of the screen there almost 30 billion naira 33 percent but the thing to 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 look at here is not just the impressive revenues despite the fact that there were disruptions in 2020 from supply chain disruptions and so on and so forth there's also the in the issue of costs um if you remember when the central bank governor visited the dangote refinery that's of course a different business segment of the dangote group Aliko Dangote uh, was talking about the importance of backward integration and how you know, it's, it's important to source for your raw materials locally. Dangote Sugar's um, uh, cost of sales increased by about 30% to 160 billion naira. Uh, they are 76% of their cost of sales came from their raw materials. Raw materials increased by 35% to 122 billion naira. So in the course of their backward integration programs where they've been trying to source more uh, sugar from here, because a portion of their costs still come from importing sugar overseas, but they are majorly moving towards doing that locally. They had a merger with um, Savannah Sugar Group, which was operate, which became uh, completed in September of last year. So they are moving in the right direction, but inflation was uh, a, a burden on their costs because it increased their cost of materials. They suffered a uh, foreign exchange loss as well, which we'll see across a different um, uh, range of companies. So while the result was very good, very impressive for a pandemic year, we still have to keep in mind that their costs were pretty high, especially when it comes to their sourcing of raw materials. And we move on to Nestle. Uh, Nestle, of course, is in the uh, food and consumer goods in the food and beverage business. Nestle's results were impressive. You can see in the red there, they are, uh, while their revenues were up just by 1%, so 287 billion naira, you can see their gross profit dropping by 7%, profit before tax dropping by 14%, uh, profit after tax dropping by 14.1% as well. Nestle, it's the same story. Um, they are, this raw, raw material costs jump by about 13%. Their cost of sales jump by 10%. If your revenue is climbing by just 1%, but your cost of goods is rising by 10%, then you have a problem. Nestle also have a significant amount of loans that they took from their parent company. So they had an increase in finance costs, but pretty much the same issues that Dangote Sugar was facing in terms of cost of doing business, acquisition of raw, you know, getting raw materials, inventory buildup, the pandemic, they, were, they, they suffered heavily. Um, I think beverages is what really drove their revenues for Nestle. Beverage revenue was up about 6.9%, almost 7%, but food revenue fell by 2.5%. So they, they struggled a bit, and it's because of the amount of costs that they are, they are, they are facing. Um, so from Nestle, we go to uh, MTN. Uh, MTN. Huh. Now, so this is where we're looking at food in one section. Now we're looking at telco. So look at this. MTN, record-breaking revenue, 1.3 trillion, with a T, trillion naira. This is the highest uh, revenue line we've seen for any publicly traded company in Nigeria. 15% increase from 2019. Operating profit, 426 billion. 8.5% increase, profit before tax, 2.6% two, uh, increase. You can still see, despite the gargantuan increase in revenue, look at their profit after tax. It's just 0.95% higher than, uh, than 2019. 205 billion naira. Oh, MTN2 helps you. If you look at our we can take a look at our revenue breakdown. I think we've got two uh, uh, slides here, revenue breakdown. Voice and data accounted for about 98% total of MTN's revenue for 2019. You can see voice increasing by 5.6%. Look at data, 51% increase versus 2019, which tells you when you think about people renewing data, 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 you can see how the data filters into their revenue. SMS um, revenue fell versus 2019, which tells you that I guess Nigerians weren't sending as many SMS messages as they were with data browsing. And then this inter interconnection and roaming, that's at the bottom for those of you that travel overseas and roam your phone. You can see how much revenue they made from that, 133 uh, billion naira. So it tells you that even with the telcos, I guess a lot of people staying home, the pandemic Draw, you know, uh, pretty much fed into them, uh, increasing their revenues. But they also face a lot of costs, like Dangote Sugar, like Nestle. Um, MTN has to pay a lot in you know, the regulatory fees. There's also the FX impact on uh, their uh, revenues because a lot of their towers, I believe, they, are, they have dollar liabilities with respect to some of their towers that they have. And so with the devaluation, the two devaluations we saw last year, 
when you are, when you have dollar liabilities and you're paying bills in dollars if the dollar moves against you then your costs are going to grow up go up so look the general thing here is that just looking at these three companies dangote sugar uh, nestle and mtn uh, you know from food to consumer goods uh, and then also with telcos essentially you can see that they, 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 they did okay right as far as the year was concerned but Going forward, looking at the, the environment, the regulatory environment, the cost of doing business, it is impacting on these companies. And had inflation not been so high, cost of acquiring goods not been so high, we probably have been seeing even better revenues from these companies. But, um, I mean, you know, it's only a handful. This is only three. There's a whole bunch of other companies not doing so well. But it just gives you a snapshot of what they went through in 2020. All right. The question okay. to ask is, how do these companies manage to post these good numbers? Mm. Uh, considering the fact that all of us were concerned about the uh, constriction of the global commerce environment in the year 2020. Mm. Well, the telcos, you can easily explain, but if you were to add the banks, the banks also made, uh, you know, uh, good numbers, um, and the stock market was uh, bullish. So to uh, an ordinary person, the question would be, what explains this? There's some kind of special magic uh, that was adopted. You can understand that of the telcos, for example. Uh, but right. These other companies, uh, banks, cement companies, what kind of magic uh, did they apply? Considering the fact that, in fact, uh, you know, there were, there were issues with supply chains in the year uh, 2020. That, for me, is a question. And for investors, I know uh, you economists and financial analysts, you don't like to give free advice. Uh, but are there are certain things that, you know, the investing community can take away from this kind of report? Yes. Um, the, the, what you can take away from it as an investor is that if these companies are still, you know, posting profitable numbers, then that's going to filter in to um, their, their stock prices. Uh, MTN, I think their dividend, for a full year dividend is about 9 naira, 50, almost 10 naira dividends that, they, that, they, um, that they're going to be paying out. Decent dividend yield, decent payout ratio. Um, also, um, Dangote Sugar is also going to be paying out a dividend. So you're, you're getting capital appreciation, which is the increase in the stock price for each of these companies, and also the dividends they're paying out, which is the company sharing in the profits with shareholders. So shareholders are smiling. As far as the company performance, not much magic. I mean, Dangote Sugar was able to increase their sales volumes. There could have been also price increases there, here and there for some of, their, for some of these items. Nestle didn't do well. I mean, well, I shouldn't say Nestle didn't do well. Revenue was still up, but at the end of the day, their profit after tax was down by 14%. So Nestle kind of struggled a bit. So it's not all companies across the board performing magic. Mostly telecommunications because we're all staying home. Again, for MTM, almost 98% uh, of their revenues were from voice and data. So the more calls you and I were making and more data, data pop-ups on our okay. phones, revenues for telcos. So that's essentially how uh, the companies do it. For the financial services, more people sending, you know, doing transfers at home instead of visiting banks. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's, you have to cherry pick which of the sectors did well. But okay. investors in those companies will be happy because they, they did well. It's we expected that 2021 mm -hmm. should be better with the delivery of vaccines and so on and so forth. Okay, Rotus, I mean, my argument is this, and, and this just has to be stated. Technology made the difference in all of this. When you look at the numbers critically, you can now see why Nigeria jumped out of the recession with over 0.11% growth because of the technology sector. And let me tell you what made the difference. Data made the difference. Data made the difference. Uh, but we, we need to go at this time. Thank you so much uh, for your time, Rotus. We'll go for a quick break. We'll come back and talk to Michael Wilson. Right, moving on to... Business outlook on the global scale. Michael Wilson Jones from London. Great to have you, Michael. Morning. Yeah, uh, well, market's sort of on the mend, really, uh, overnight, or is our overnight, when well, you're overnight too. Um, inflation fears slightly subsiding. Asian markets took a bit of a breather, but I um, have to say that in the final hours of trading, um, a senior Chinese banking regulator warned of bubble worries, you know, that kind of thing that we've been talking about. And basically, um, so there was a bit of a mixed finish. But you have to contrast that with um, PMIs from the United States and also from Europe yesterday. And despite the fact that Asia delivered that kind of slightly Lunar New Year affected result, I, because many people have been an, on holiday, um, it looks like inflation fears have slightly gone away, but we'll see 
we need to factor into that, of course, the fact that the uh, the Biden stimulus package, as well as the J&J COVID-19 uh, vaccine approval, Novavax not that far behind, those might put inflation fears back in the box. They might bring them to the fore. I don't know at the moment, but that's it. I want to draw your attention to M. SMIC, it's China's largest contract uh, semiconductor manufacturer. Manufacturer, it doesn't have huge um, technological advances, but given that the, the global supply of semiconductors, many people feel as though uh, that will actually advance a lot. So its shares are rising in China. U.S. recap: the United States, the picture paints, as I said, a rapidly uh, recovering economy there, juiced up by another 1.9 trillion thing. Will that be inflation? Well, I don't know. Again, we've talked about that kind of thing. But the Dow rallied by 1.95% yesterday, the biggest one day since June. Zoom, it's expected its boom will continue beyond the pandemic. It predicts faster both uh, growth in the coming year, moving from what it describes itself as being a, a killer app company, uh, not just about video conferencing now, but becoming a platform they're predicting they're predicting revenues for the coming year up 40 percent, 40 percent. That's what they're saying. Shares of Apple closed up uh, yesterday to a price of $127, outpacing the Nasdaq in general. That bump came after the Barclay, uh, um, Berkshire Hathaway chairman, CEO Warren Buffett. Well, yes, you know, he was talking over the weekend. Uh, it is, in terms of his portfolio, Berkshire's third most valuable asset. Uh, and he praised uh, the company quite fulsomely, particularly about its share buyback situation. Here in the UK, um, now the budget, uh, the Chancellor, the Finance Minister, it hopes will be arming the city for a, for a sort of fight back uh, with a listings re regime to shake it up for more IPOs and also SPACs as well. We've talked about those. I don't think we need to uh, tell our viewers anything more about those kind of things. I think they're a bit bubbly, but there we are. Uh, more dual class shares. That gives the founders of companies more control over where those companies actually go. Uh, obviously facing competition from uh, other places like Dublin and Luxembourg. They're the top ones. Amsterdam, too. Nearly half of firms have moved their staff or some of their staff into the EU as a result of Brexit. 8,000 jobs have left the finance centre. UK, though, um, is attracting Trustpilot. This is the biggest company from the EU to announce plans to list in the UK. And also, finally, some statistics here about hybrid cars. We have a big consumer thing called Which, which has been going for many, many years, which is a consumer company, a consumer magazine as well. And they're saying that power supply cars, uh, mixed power supply cars are far less efficient than their advertising actually claims. As far as commodities are concerned, we talked a little bit about this yesterday. OPEC plus meets on Thursday. Brent crude is falling as a result of that. There may be more supply. Uh, expectations are rising that uh, OPEC will, in fact, OPEC plus rather, will um, reduce the production, production cuts, production cuts even further. That's not helping. Gold, its woes actually continue. Uh, stage an intraday rally, but it's still around about that $17.60 uh, an ounce and uh, it's looking really increasingly bleak for, for that precious metal. Over to you. That's the global. Yes, Michael, uh, very quickly. Uh, let's start with uh, Zoom. Eric Yuan, the Zoom uh, boss, uh, is very uh, uh, enthusiastic about what I will call the future of work. He believes that remote work will continue and that remote work has become the new normal. Well, is his optimism uh, well placed? I, I know, I mean, his business doing uh, over 326% uh, in terms of. Uh, advantage and profit, you will probably want that to continue. But with supplies, with vaccination increasing, are we uh, at a place where remote work uh, has become the new normal? Secondly, uh, yesterday, our own uh, Dr. Ngozi okonjo uh assumed office at the headquarters of the uh, WTO in Geneva. And two issues that she spoke about. One, uh, fishery subsidies, the negotiations on that. And she says it's about time that ended after two decades of negotiations. I know Santiago Wills, ambassador, uh, you know, for, uh, is an, a, excited. Uh, but again, our optimism, what do you think WTO can do in that regard? And then our commitment 
uh, to the issue of ensuring uh, global vaccine equity and ending uh, protectionism around the issues of the uh, supply chains in terms of uh, the relationship between rich countries and developing countries with regard to the vaccine. Right, vaccine, first of all, what it needs, what somebody needs to do is to convince the naysayers that actually the vaccine is probably quite a good idea. And our queen actually was talking about this, wasn't she, last week when she said, actually, you should have the vaccine is complete. I can't tell you what to do, she says, but you take it for other people, not just for yourself. So that's number one. Now, if you can get over that. And I know there are many countries around the world, particularly France, for example, where there's a high level of anti-vaxxers, as they're called. If you can convince them that they really ought to have this then I feel as though the over-ordering countries, and the UK has, has already said it will do this, is to pass on those vaccines to less well-developed countries. I would urge, not that I am a politician, but I mean, one would be, imagine, wouldn't one, that, that, company, that countries, for example, like Ghana, which is a gold producer, um, was talking about a shortage of vaccines. How come a gold producer is, is short of vaccines? That's to do with the government, isn't it, rather than the willingness of the population to take it. So a lot of that needs to be done. The WTO can say what it likes, but it is down to individual countries to do it. I think she'll do very well in terms of subsidies. She's a tough woman. She, she's got plenty of experience, unlike, as it was alleged by the United States. I think she's got plenty of experience. She's very impressive. And I think that level playing field of subsidies is something that the WTO will obviously get its teeth into. If it can't have any leverage about trade deals being uh, exempt from that or, or helped or hindered because of too much government subsidy, then, then, then good for them. Zoom. Yes. So what's happened is now Zoom is is moving. Now, this this is quite important. It's moving. And you're quite right to finger it up. It's moving from being a an app, as it were, to becoming a platform. Now, if it's becoming a platform, uh, you know, I'm thinking like Facebook and I'm thinking Google and so on, which are platforms. They are caught now into it's whether they're actually fattening their product is to do with being coming up publisher or not. So what does Zoom actually want to do as a platform? As, so that's number one. Number two, when I don't know what it's like with you, but when I talk to my friends who work in the city here, they say they are not going to go back to their offices. They're not going to go onto public transport, except when they actually need to. The, the rising wish of people to work from home is quite significant, much higher than it was a year ago. So I think that's what Zoom is putting its money on. Video conferencing is not high deal. Face to face is always better. I personally find those Zoom conferences a pain because you've got to keep your attention up for an hour. You know, you have to look interested for an hour and you might want to look away. You might want to do something else just like you do in normal kind of meetings. But I feel as though Zoom is onto something. And I do. And if you if you're asking me whether the new normal will be pe people going back to the office as they originally were, I think the answer to that question, according to surveys here, at least is a resounding no. I wonder how intangibles like culture, which is really important in the city, will be communicated and taught and trained into people via Zoom. But that's not my question. My question relates to a bill that U.S. Democrat Senator Elizabeth Warren and other progressives in the Senate are trying to introduce the ultra-millionaire tax. It's not exactly noblesse oblige if they have to be forced to pay up two cents to the dollar, so two percent if they're worth $50 million to $1 billion, and 3% if they're worth $1 billion and above. What are your thoughts on that for, you know, pandemic, post-pandemic recovery? My thoughts are good luck with it. I mean, it seems like a good idea for those of us who don't earn that kind of money, doesn't it? The question is, what's it going to mean? What do these people actually do? What, for example, would Bill Gates pay? And how would Bill Gates actually, somebody like Bill Gates or Elon Musk, both those people... Uh, and Jeff Bezos, quite honestly. I mean, what, 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 what do, do those, would those people not say to be, yeah, but you know what? I do charitable work as well. Part of my influence is to make people do better because the great American dream is that they can do, they can be like me with a good idea. I feel as though it's, it, it sounds like a good idea. It's very simplistic, number one. And, and I feel as though it's, it's very much kind of, well, we're all pressing our noses up against the glass, hoping that rich people actually pay something. Well, they might do, but they, they might well argue that they do other things as well. That's the danger about it. I feel as though it'll fizzle out, quite honestly, but it's no bad idea. I mean, it's a good idea. Pretty much uh, the idea of Tomar Piketty, 
in his book, Capital in 21st Century, and uh, Elizabeth Warren and Tamar Piketty are actually very good friends. Uh, but two questions. You, you kept on talking about SPACs last week. But guess what? Jamie Dimon says we shouldn't go to SPACs, that they're not the way forward as regards investment tools. And uh, also speaking, Jamie Dimon was also speaking yesterday, and he said, please, let's go off this U.S. 10-year Treasury thing coming out of uh, uh, Dimon, yeah. Let's go off this U.S. Treasury thing coming off uh, the Fed. Uh, it's not going to work. It's not good to touch. Also, uh, what, what, what's, what's his name now? The, the CEO of Goldman Sachs, too, was saying yesterday that people will go back to work. So all this euphoria about the fourth industrial revolution and everybody staying at home and working is not sustainable. That's, uh, that's Solomon, DJ Sol. I mean, the, the DJ guy that is <laughs> the investment banker CEO of Goldman Sachs. He was the one saying that yesterday. What's your take on this? I, I don't think he's right. I think that I don't think that people will go back to work. I think there is a certain amount of them. But if you look at the driver of it, which is commercial property, they are factoring in the fact that offices will actually need, need much less space. How, for example, do you do you evacuate a tower like Canary, one of them is those in Canary Wharf, for example, or one of those on Wall Street? How long does it take to evacuate a building if one person is going to go in a lift? Does it does, it, does will it involve social distancing? I I really don't see it. I'm not saying that everybody will work from home. And I, and I think the point about culture is a very, very important one, because as everybody knows, what you do is, if you're smart, is that you copy what other people do within the office situation. You ask them for advice. The, your advantage is that you're younger usually than they are, so you don't have to make the mistakes that they do, and you can just copy what they do, take their best advice. That's that's growing up. That's what, that's what the, you know, most people actually leaving home will actually go to an office. It's their first experience of grown-up life. Now, I'm not. it's not good to be behind a screen, but the fact of the matter is until a large proportion, a large rump of people decide to go back to the office, then, then they probably will. As far as SPACs are concerned, I don't think they're a good idea. I don't think a good idea or a bad idea. I mean, they might be. There's 180 of them in New York at the moment. There are none in London. Does it have a bubble scent to it? Yes, it certainly does. What's actually pushing it? The usual. Yield. That's all it is. Just people saying we, we want to get some interest. You put it in a bank, you get nothing. You put it in a SPAC, you might get a, a company working well. But does it does it have a smack of the bubble about it? Yes, it most certainly does. And I think that that's a big warning sign as well. People are looking at it very, very carefully. The problem is it might start to have a life of its own. If it does, then it will be a bubble. Treasuries. Jamie too is talking about treasuries real quickly, briefly as we wrap up. It says don't touch the 10-year America treasury the Fed is putting out. Don't touch it. Oh, okay. Jamie Dimon said, well, he can. I mean, yeah, you know, I, uh, I, what, what, what does he mean? You mean you don't want to go long term as far as bonds are concerned, but the bond market makes up its own price about these kind of things. It's not like somebody saying, don't do this. What, I'm not quite sure what he's what he's afraid of. If, you know, I'd rather go to a bond dealer, not that I would, because it's deeply complicated. But if he's, what he's saying is that the implication is they'll be worth nothing because interest rates are going to rise, that's the question. Now, is that what he's saying? If, he, if he's saying that, very possibly, who knows? I that's exactly what he's saying, I should tell you, because of interest rates and, you know, the inflation that will come out of all this $1.9 trillion spent in America has turned out. But thank you so much for your time, uh, Michael. For updates on COVID-19 pandemic, I just want more right here. That will be after a quick commercial break. We'll be right back. All right, for updates on COVID-19 pandemic, I just want more right here with us. Adesua, great to have you. Good morning. Adesua? Good morning, Rafai. Good morning, Dr. Abati, and good yeah. morning, Tundrum. Good morning. Yes, so the number of coronavirus uh, globally, uh, infections globally, actually rose last week, uh, bucking the unprecedented trend, uh, which had raised hopes that the pandemic was actually abating. Um, the WHO Director General Tedros Ghebreyesus described the rise in cases as disappointing but not surprising and he's urging countries not to relax measures to fight the disease. If we have the graph for the, uh, exactly this graph, uh, you see that we are, we are beginning to see a, a rise in infections and deaths again globally. Uh, this is according to the Johns Hopkins University tally. But here in Nigeria, uh, another 360 new cases of COVID-19 were confirmed in the last 24 hours. The largest number of infections came from Lagos, 
uh, which saw 120 cases. And still in Nigeria, ahead of the arrival of the COVID-19 vaccines, uh, yesterday, the federal government launched a strategy for the rollout of the vaccines. Uh, it's codenamed TEACH, which combines indigenous traditional approaches with modern technologically enabled systems of vaccination, as well as leveraging experiences gained during the polio eradication. Uh, it would help the government, they say, to track the vaccination process across the country and also ensure a phased and equitable distribution. Now, the NHP. NHPCDA, which is the primary uh, body for immunization in Nigeria, has also approved an uh, electronic registration link to enable Nigerians to provide information on their preferred location to receive their doses pending the availability of this vaccine. So there you have it on your screen, the teach strategy, the phases of people that will, be, uh, that will be vaccinated, and of course the link to register. Uh, I'm talking about the vaccines, in about three hours from now, guys, Nigeria's first tranche of COVID-19 vaccines should be touching down at the Nnamdi Azikiwe International Airport in the nation's capital, Abuja. Uh, they're coming from Mumbai, India. It will be a truly historic moment for the, for the continent's most populous nation, Nigeria. Um, there would be a small ceremony to receive the vaccines, we've been told. It would be chaired by the PTF chairman and not the president. A few vows would be handed to NAVDAC to be analyzed. Uh, a lot of the initial action for the vaccination campaign would be in Abuja for a while. Uh, that's because all vaccines, we are now told, would arrive at the Namdi Azikiwe International Airport. Any other entry into the country would be considered illegal. It would be confiscated by customs and NAVDAC. Uh, we also told yesterday at the PTF that once uh, NAVDAC approves this uh, vaccine, which is the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, strategic leaders, including the President, the Vice President, Inspector General of Police, Service Chiefs, Attorney General of the Federation, National Assembly leaders, traditional and religious leaders, would be vaccinated publicly in Abuja before it then moves to the state. We were then told that once again, uh, the private sector has come in to fill a void because the coalition against COVID-19, CACOVID, is providing a plane to transport to states. For those states who do not have airports, they have to be transported uh, via roads uh, in fitted vehicles escorted by security. And for those Nigerians who are worried uh, over sharp practices during this vaccination campaign, they may be assured by the plans of the federal government to ensure strict monitoring, not only by the health regulators in the country, but also by the ESCC, the DSS, the ICPC, and of course, civil society organizations. So it will seem all is now set for vaccination campaign in Nigeria against COVID-19. This is exciting news and it should be for everyone. Uh, finally, on the first day of her job uh, at the WTO, Ungozi Okonjo Iwiala, Nigeria's Ungozi Okonjo Iwiala, uh, that's her arriving at Geneva WTO yesterday. Uh, she, you know, in her speech to the WTO's 164 members at a meeting, stressed the need for technology transfer. I know Dr. Abati mentioned uh, something about this to Michael a moment ago. Uh, she stressed that people are dying in poor countries. You recall that South Africa and India had raised the issue of intellectual property rights uh, last year. Uh, this was, you know, waved aside by a lot of countries. And then we saw about last week, two weeks ago, the head of the African Union, uh, CDC, Mr. Nkasengong, uh, also raised this issue. But now we are seeing the DGWTO also weighing on the matter of technology transfer to enable this vaccine production in poorer countries. Well, first, uh, congratulations again to Dr. Ngozi okonjo -Wella. She uh, assumed office yesterday, and as we said yesterday, she hit the ground uh, running. She not only chaired uh, a meeting of the General Council, uh, she also at the same time granted interviews and issued very strong statement on a number of issues. And it's interesting to see that she's been consistent in opposing protectionism and uh, nationalism, particularly with vaccines. And she's defending the interests of the developing countries. Now, she is saying that the manufacturers uh, should give a patent information to countries in poor parts of the world that have the capacity to be able to develop the vaccine mm -hmm. so that equity access, you know, can be uh, facilitated. But you know, of course, that this has been a major issue. Pfizer, Moderna, even Johnson & Johnson 
There are CEOs are saying, no, they do not intend to give any patent uh, information. Countries like South Africa, Brazil, and countries in Southeast Asia have also been saying, look, we have the capacity. Yeah. We can roll out the vaccines uh, much uh, faster. In Bangladesh, you know, there are factories, about three factories that are waiting, are just ready for, for the patent. But the uh, Europe and the United States in the WTO have been blocking uh, that access to the intellectual uh, property. Well, we hope that Dr. Ngozi okonjo iweala will be able to address this and that uh, she will get the necessary support from Europe and also from the United States to ensure that the emphasis is on what Ursula von der Leyen, uh, the head of the EU, uh, EU Commission, refers to as the global common good. But the EU talks about the global common good, but they are not willing, they are not ready uh, to commit to it. As for Nigeria, yes, great excitement. We look forward to the arrival today of the air vaccines. And it's encouraging to hear from Dr. Fisa Shaib, uh, the head of the uh, 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 National Primary Health Care Development Agency, that Nigeria is prepared, that we have the storage facilities. But from your report, are there certain things that you can do? One, uh, the local, uh, or what do you call it, local strategy, or is it indigenous strategy? The T E A C H. Now, what does that mean in real terms? Uh, it's an acronym. I, I've not had anybody breaking it down. Okay, you have it there yeah. on the screen. Yeah, I thought it's important that that is broken down uh, for the Nigerian people. Secondly, we're told that uh, frontline health workers are already being trained. Uh, we hope also that there will be uh, good coordination and good synergy between the federal government and the states. Now, you also said traditional rulers, the president and some key officials uh, will be the first uh, to take the vaccine. Well, they will be following in the footsteps of other African leaders, as we have seen in Zimbabwe, Seychelles, Mauritius, uh, and even South Africa, where, you know, the leaders were the first to take it. And the issue relates to what Boss Mustafa, the secretary to the government of the Federation, uh, referred to about vaccine hesitancy. And he also talked about elite resistance. Well, do they have a communication strategy in place? Because they will also need a communication strategy to be able to address the challenge of vaccine hesitancy. I'm going to add to that Ghana, where their president, Nana Kufuado, has been front and center. He's been publicly vaccinated, as was his wife. So what do you think of that, Adiswa? We've discussed this briefly at some point, where the UK used the model of the first person to be vaccinated was in that vulnerable demographic. She was an elderly lady. In America, it was a nurse, another vulnerable demographic, a healthcare worker. But in Africa, it appears to be people who, I suppose, society is supposed to look up to and trust and to encourage them to actually take the vaccinations. We don't have that much time, unfortunately. I wanted you to tell me your thoughts on our approach to it. Well, thank you so much for your time, Mother. So I really appreciate you.